introduction. Uh, she is a South Asian American author. I'm uh, Trimiso. She was born in uh, England, but then she, well, she moved with her family to the United States when she was around uh, three years old. So she basically grew up in in, uh, in America. Uh, her entire fictional work, I mean, she has written mostly fiction and uh, her work deals mainly with um, South Asian American uh, characters and cultural dilemmas experienced by by them, by first generation, by second generations. Uh, however, recently she um, uh, she has, uh, well, in a way, moved a little bit further from uh, these topics in the sense that she uh, she turned both to, um, I mean, she changed the, her genre in the sense that she turned to autobiography and also uh, she has changed the language in which she writes, namely she, she swif- switched from um, uh, English to Italian. And uh, in this uh, presentation today, I will... Um, I will analyze her work in other words. Uh, it is, um, uh, which is um, an autobiographical work uh, that documents her uh, adventure. Let's say her adventure in Italy, um, because she at some point she relocated to Rome with her family uh, in order to learn Italian and, uh, well, to in a way. <laughs> Uh, try to figure out how uh, to make sense of her multifaceted identity. Un moment, uh, vedeți ecranul? Colegii, vedeți ecranul sau nu? Da, da, se vede. Ah, bun. Atunci, Elena, vezi, trebuie să vezi și tu. Uh, yes, I, I can see it. Yes, da? yes, yes. Okay. You can. It's, so this is well. This is the book, uh, and um, you can you can move on. So and in this particular uh, presentation, uh, which is an interdisciplinary one, uh, blending cultural studies and literary studies, uh, I will try to focus on how twenty uh, first century uh, well South Asian, South Asian American author uh, relies in a way writes in Italian, and uh, as we will see, uh, relies on um, or at least she tries to uh, rely on uh, Western cultural. Rep- references and mythology in order to make sense of her identity. So next slide, if you please. Thank you. Uh, so I will, um, in my discussion, I will, uh, of course, uh, rely on theories regarding myth, I, uh, autobiography, identity, uh, and uh, as well as um, notions of exile um, and transnationalism. And finally, uh, moving on to the, to the actual myth that she employs. Uh, Okay, thank you. The next one. Uh, So interestingly, um, uh, Lahiri, um, I thought of her following uh, uh, Joseph Campbell uh, and Van Genev's theories as a hero in our quest, uh, in the sense that I think she undergoes uh, uh, a separation, an initiation, and then we will see what kind of return uh, as she she goes to Italy. And I thought uh, for her, um, Italy can be considered um, a zone, well, a, a journey into into a zone unknown. Uh, and uh, as she uh, she starts her journey to Italy, she actually invokes the goat Janus, uh, which is you know my vote acuma, but it's okay. No my vote PowerPoint. Uh, Janus is uh, interestingly a Roman god uh, um, who doesn't have now I can see it, uh, who doesn't have a Greek counterpart, and it is the god of um, of thresholds of transitions. And And I think by uh, by invoking this god from the very beginning, Lahiri, uh, in a way, uh, sets her uh, story of identity within a mythical framework, and she tries to connect with the Roman space as she invokes this uh, particular, I mean, god uh, that is specific to to, to Rome. Uh, moreover, at some point, she she confesses that she loves uh, this monument, the Portico di Ottavia, and again, I think the idea of, of Portico points to the to, to the process of transition, and um, and um, at the same time, uh, this monument has actually been uh, built uh, with a contribution uh, at the initiative of uh, Mark Anthony's wife, Octavia, and I think by invoking this female, this monument again, Lahiri, in a way, tries to connect herself with a female, uh, um, let's say, uh, important uh, feminine figure of uh, Roman space and then in a way create a bond with this space. And uh, yes, uh, and I think because we talked about these liminal rights of separation, and I think Lahiri tries in a way by plunging into this into the Italian culture, she tries to separate herself from the culture of her, I mean, from uh, the cultures that in a way claim her. And I think maybe her journey can be considered a, a, a search for adulthood because um, she she keeps invoking the struggle. I mean, the struggle, her personal struggle between um, 
her cultural inheritance. Uh, on the one hand, Bengali, uh, well, the parents' language, uh, and then uh, English, that is uh, the language in which she, she feels more secure, and as a writer especially, and, and then Italian, that is, uh, well, it, she associates with the future and with a with free identity reconstruction, because it is a language chosen by her, um, as I mean, as opposed to the other two. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. So we can continue with the next slide. Um, and here I think it, it, it is important to um, to notice the fact that Lahiri, I mean, why she, she switched to autobi autobiography. And I think here it is important to mention that both myth, myth and autobiography have something in common in point of identity. I mean, both narratives uh, are meant to, to to assign a, a sense of a sense and a meaning to to one's identity. So then I think her switch to autobiography uh, can be, of course, uh, I mean, illustrates, uh, as she confesses in these two quotes, uh, her, I mean, it illustrates her desire to uh, figure out her, what happens with her identity, how to, how to integrate and assemble all, all these facets, um, yeah, of um, Italian, Bengali and, and American English. Uh, and in this sense, yeah, autobiography function has a psychological function of uh, providing answers and uh, potential, not closures, but in a way possibilities of understanding the self. And uh, the notion of exile is again important in Rahiri's case because, um, I mean, she, we cannot talk about actual exile in her case because uh, her movement to Rome is voluntary. I mean, Lahiri belongs to an elite uh, who has access to transnational mobility so she can travel whenever she wants she can, she can cross physical borders and um, but she she keeps mentioning the idea of exile all the time especially in relation to languages and all the slides here I mean this one and the one that uh, follow uh, illustrate the idea of linguistic exile because she exp she, she, she ex explains or she tries at least to, to explain that she she feels exiled from from Bengali because she doesn't uh, master the language properly uh, when she's in America she feels exiled from it Italian and uh, at some point she confesses that uh, and we can move on with the slides because it's almost the same idea in, in all of them um, she uh, she compares herself to Ovid as we know the Roman poet who was exiled to to, 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 to Thomas but uh, however uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, Ovid was exiled to Thomas uh, through a political act and so he was uh, I mean not voluntarily so then uh, he didn't have a choice while I hear it does have a choice when she moves to Rome. But anyway, she tries to establish this kind of connection between her and Ovid uh, with the, respect to the idea of displacement and separation from something dear to her. And and uh, she goes on to say that even she feels uh, she feels exiled from even from the English language. So in a way, she experiences a total. Uh, we can move on with the slides. She she experiences um, a continuous state of uh, uprootedness and suspension. Uh, uh, resulted from resulting from this uh, plurality that she doesn't seem to be able to master properly. Uh, we can continue because here is again. I mean, she she talks about um, and here in in the in the third slide here again she talks about the separation from English language. Uh, despite the fact that she masters English very well, still she doesn't really feel uh, comfortable in in this language because she she considers that I mean in America uh, she feels pressured in a way to speak language English, the English language when she is outside the family. Well, when, when well she is with when she is with her family she feels feels compelled to speak Bengali and so. Yes, uh, and in the in the following slide, she uh, she expresses her um, feeling. Um uh, well, um, a sense of suspension and a split, and I think here the notion of existential exile uh, is is useful in the sense that by existential exile, uh, the author Simon Burr, uh, relying on Camus as well, uh, understands the idea of the impossibility of forming meaningful relations and connections, and and, and home is not necessarily a physical space, but this state of uh, of harmony. Uh, and I think here is haunted actually by this existential exile, um, and uh, she. As, as these quotations um, illustrate, yeah, so a condition, an existential condition that has marked my life. So although she's very uh, mobile and, and transnational, at the same time, she's haunted by this, uh, this feeling of, of um, inability to form roots. We can continue. And in this context, um, uh, well, 
her her idea of incompleteness again it's something that haunts her all the time and i would say that uh, in this context she invokes uh, uh, the ovid ovid's uh, met 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 the metamorphosis we can move on um and that she considered uh, she considers uh, uh, ovid's uh, work i think um, uh, um i think she's attracted uh, by this because the uh, because of of the changes of the violent baroque changes that are expressed in in Ovid metamorphosis we can we can continue um uh, and I think uh, this is why, in a way, here autobiography again can be considered. I mean, illustrates what uh, Bruno Jerome considers the, the turning points that autobiography is meant to to be canonical and non-canonical at the same time. On the one hand, it expresses. Uh, I mean, it has to express something that can be accepted uh, within the within the well conventions of certain cultures. But at, at the same time, uh, it has to express something unique about an individual. And uh, Jerome. Uh, Bruno re refers to the turning points in one's life. That is uh, uh, important changes, uh, freeing changes. And I think this is what happens to Lahiri once she decides to, to, to move to Rome and, and learn Italian. We can move on. Um, and here uh, she invokes uh, she invokes Ovid with uh, and she confesses that she's impressed by uh, the nature of transformations that she can find in the metamorphosis. And later on, she actually translates she has translated Ovid, uh, and she confesses in in her very recent book, translating myself and others. So she translates Ovid from Latin to into English. Uh, we can continue, uh, and and more particularly, she is attracted by um, by the story of Daphne and Apollo in. Uh, I mean, from from uh, the stories uh, of its stories, uh, and uh, in in the following slides, I have. Uh, I mean, Nana, if you if you please, uh, there are some representations uh, across time of the myth, so you can unfold. I mean, um, and I was uh, well intrigued by. I mean, Lahiri's choice. So why has she chosen uh, this particular myth? And I think uh, because it, because because it talks about becoming rooted. I mean, Daphne, as we know, is chased by Apollo, and finally she she begs her father to. I mean, to save her, and she's turned into a tree. And I think um, this is in a way paradoxical for Lahiri because although she she cherishes human mobility uh, a lot, as we can see in the in the in the following slide, um, we know that in in her um, collection of stories, Anakas and Earth, uh, she has chosen uh, this fragment from uh, as a motto. So a fragment from Nathalian Hawthorne, where um, she she cherishes, she celebrates the idea of moving, of of moving and replanting one's uh, uh, well, replanting one's identity, let's say, in in different soils. So I think in her case, what she she tries to find is um, the idea of belonging and uh, I mean feeling of rootedness, but only through movement. So I think this is why uh, um, she has um, I mean Ovid's uh, story of that. Um, I don't know, struck her strongly. And uh, we can continue because we are almost, uh, so this is, um, well, the, the, the Annika and Earth and uh, with, uh, with a motto from Hawthorne. Uh, and as, as a conclusion, I would say that we have myth, we have myth, mythical representations that have a, a transcendent dimension that, uh, well, enable individuals to move, I mean, to find meanings elsewhere. And uh, the myth, myth and autobiography um, intersect, in Lahiri's case, uh, in this process of identity, identity redefinition and maybe trying to transcend uh, the condition of existential exile through art. Uh, again, an idea of Camus invoked by Stephen Burr. Uh, and Daphne, Daphne uh, represents the idea of female, uh, female metamorphosis uh, through uh, relocation and becoming um, uprooted, uh, rooted, sorry, by losing one's mobility. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for the incident. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you a lot. Um, bah, maintenant, uh, écoutez uh, l'intervention uh, d'Emilia Andrea Motorani um, et une intervention intitulée Réinterprétation des mythes en publicité. Um, Madame uh, Motorano est assistante universitaire. Euh, et docteur, elle est membre du département de langue et lettres, euh, pardon, de langue moderne et de communication commerciale de la faculté des relations économiques internationales de l'Académie d'études économiques de Bucarest. Ses principaux centres d'intérêt sont la communication d'entreprise en français, 
le roman en langue étrangère, la littérature universelle et la littérature de l'exil.